well, thank you very much for accepting my paper in the first place. And I should say I'm just one of many who have involved in writing this paper. According to DeLanda, assemblages have both properties and possible capacities. A capacity is latent or virtual, as he puts it, in the sense that its properties have the possibility to act in an effective manner. Uh, but the capacity may or may not be exercised. For DeLanda, at least in his interpret interpretation of Deleuze, the virtual is the structural space of possibility. It's a space of possibility. He uses the ideas of a manufactured knife uh, contrasted against that of the natural uh, obsidian stone. So these are his words. A knife has the actual property of being sharp and a virtual capacity to cut. If we imagine instead of a manufactured object, a sharp obsidian stone existing before life, we could ascribe to it that same capacity to cut. A capacity it perhaps occasionally exercised on softer rocks that fell on top of it. But when living creatures large enough to be pierced by stone appeared on this planet, the stone suddenly acquired the capacity to kill. This implies that without changing any of its properties, the possibility space associated with the capacity of the stone become larger. So for Delanda, this, the possibility space of the obsidian knife to kill, once an animal exists, is real. A real virtuality, as he puts it. Uh, the actual only emerges when uh, a catalyst enacting the cutting uh, occurs. So ontologically, we have a distinction between the virtual and the actual as defined by possibility space. One in which the structure presents poss possibilities, the other when such possibilities are actualized. Both are intrinsic to assemblages, but only with actualization do assemblages uh, operate as affective entities and express their capacities. Importantly, assemblages by definition are relational. The way the parts relate determines how the assemblage as a whole expresses itself. This discussion does not equate directly with what we normally term virtual reality. Yet indirectly it does. In the context of this paper, I argue it's very relevant. Here we are exploring how we can envision virtual reality platforms, such as the one that we developed on the California Rocker site of Plato, within ontological terms. Certainly, the Plato VR is itself an assemblage, instantiated by headsets, photons, and sound waves, with an interlocutor experiencing the immersive, and much more to it than that. And so it is that there are unconsidered virtual possibility spaces that the Plato VR might hold. Not the least of which is to question what the affect, the indigenous ontology which originally created the artworks of Plato, plays within this VR assemblage. So what are the virtual possibility spaces of an immersive reality platform and what new actualities might uh, emerge from this? Plato is of international importance as it has the widest color palette of any known site in the Americas with intense overpaintings creating a complexity rarely seen. The paintings are extremely fragile and is in a remote location and the main cave is somewhat difficult to access. As researchers, we have occasion to inhabit the site and experience it in ways not normally available to the public. So we created a VR as a means for people to experience the cave. Here, the user can move about the cave, uh, look closely and in detail at the paintings, and even handle baskets and other materials, which we completed. We particularly developed Plato VR for the use of the local Tohon Indian tribe, so that they could utilize the VR in their own cultural education programs. The rock art is attributable to uh, native California groups such as the Chumash and their neighbors. But even as the ontology that, that created the original Plato is rightly called a relational ontology, it is different really than Delanda's ontology. Uh, it could be called a relational animism or an agent of uh, relationality in a crude shorthand way. The rock itself was not passive but likely to have been considered the petrified remains of mytholo mythological creatures turned to stone during the mythic past. Rather than inert media, pigment admixtures could be thought of as potent alchemical substances, redolent with complex agencies connected to their place of extraction and enhanced via preparation and admixture. And rather than simply symbolic or even indexical, images could be relational agents, entities in partnerships with the artists, 
like marionette strings involved in the dance mechanics of native power, they are enactors of agency influencing supernatural, physical, and social worlds. Key to Shumash understanding is the idea that things, substances, entities, persons, can all undergo transformation. Combining transformations and collogic recipes increases potentialities. This is what has been termed transmorphism by some Shumash uh, researchers. And so these rock art paintings extend beyond the field of representation. In our analysis of a figure or motif, we must incorporate the known ethnographic record of myths and stories with an ongoing process of developing theoretical frameworks to think through the possible ontological worlds in which such art was created. Our work thus becomes its own moving assemblage as we strive to incorporate theoretical constructions from anthropologies and philosophies with ongoing collaborations and insights from indigenous scholars and communities alike. We take seriously the indigenous critique of ontological theorization as an extension of colonial appropriation and disenfranchisement. And Todd aptly criticizes the lack of indigenous representation in the theorizing of concepts attributed to the very ontological world from which they are at home. So we seek a broader conversation through first considering what native artists and theorists have already achieved in the role of cyberspace in indigenous culture. So the first application of indigenous VRs was by the Salish uh, artist Lawrence Paul Yuxlewuptum, known more widely for his large mural paintings, such as this one. And I actually brought him up my very first tag paper, and here he is again. Uh, and this is titled Red Man Watching White Man Trying to Fix Big Hole in the Sky. Very appropriate uh, painting in the modern context of climate change. But he was also the first person to create an immersive VR environment involving indigenous cultural materials and practices. So he created an installation in, entitled Inherent Rights, Vision Rights, uh, abbreviated as IRVR. Uh, Yux Willupton's artwork exposes the non-initiate and non-indigenous into a world of spirits, which he is so familiar with. His name means man of many masks, a name that was bestowed on him by a secret mask society of the Coast Salish. Within that cultural context, engaging foreign cultures through a VR mask only seems fitting. As a non-traditional artwork which blurs the lines of materiality, IRVR's critical reception by other indigenous scholars and theorists has had far-reaching impact in indigenous virtual theory since that time. Uh, tracing the, uh, oh, on the, on the first approach, uh, one of the first ones to approach this, sorry, was the Cree metis theorist Loretta Todd. Drawing from uh, Hale's How We Can Be Become Postmodern, Todd emphasizes her concern with VR as a colonial technology. Tracing the history of cyberspace through Western Christian cosmologies of salvation, extension, and transcendence, Todd uh, emphasizes the discord with indigenous relational life ways. So in experiencing uh, IR VR firsthand, Todd notes the reversal of the usual modes of VR experiences. Instead of distributed subjectivity, she finds embodied virtuality that within the ones and o's of IRVR, the Coast Salish spirits might uh, be ever present. Um, Mohawk artist uh, and academic Jack Two Bears expands on this notion, um, talking about the uh, possibility of recontextualizing the Western ontology of the virtual and expanding indigenous consciousness of relational epistemologies into ever-expanding ever digital fields. So these same networks of relationships have fueled new forms of indigenous representation. And, and culture through which has become called indigenous futurism. So according to uh, Ashinabi director Lisa Jackson, and this is a quote, indigenous futurism looks to break through that tendency to stereotype everything indigenous as stuck in the past and incapable of moving into our present or indeed our future. So for our discussion, artists uh, taking part in indigenous futurism movement that have, have created remarkable outputs in the VR world which offer important and meaningful methods and ethics and purposes to consider when using VR in archeological contexts. So Jackson, for example, is the creator of the indigenous VR epic, uh, Bibiden, uh, otherwise known as First Light. The VR narrative explores an indigenous future in a post-apocalyptic Toronto, where indigenous values and lifeways have found new meanings and purpose as indigenous communities rise from a dystopic future and begin to coexist with their environment. Jackson gives special consideration to the spiritual and social ontological pinnings, underpinnings of VR. Uh, utilizing Wendat, Mohawk, and Ojibwe instead of English, participants are immersed in the future where relational engagement with an animate world is reawakened. 
Throughout indigenous futurism, indigenous thinkers, theorists, and uh, creatives have sought to reformat Western or colonial technologies and repurpose or indigenize them. In doing so, indigenous artists and theorists have shown cyberspace as something intricately connected to light and spirit, not devoid of it. Indigenous relational epistemologies, which emphasize the absence of active differentiation, have clear parallels in digital territories where ones and zeros create the multitudes of experiences, objects, and personas. In order to move towards creating a VR that is more than just lip service to indigeneity, we are trying to incorporate a native perspective into the VR itself. Edward uh, de Castro uh, cultivates an evocative theory of Amerindian uh, perspectivism, looking to situate his metaphysics both in a tradition of Western philosophy, but moreover as inspired by his field work with comparative studies of animistic cultures. Uh, for de Castro, Amerindian thought does not simply take Western categories of nature and culture and reformulate them, but rather these categories take on a different status entirely. They no longer refer to discrete ontological provinces. They emerge through the exchangeable perspective and relation, relational positional context or point of view. In contrast to the ontological mapping of his contemporary Discola, in which animism is but one of a host of ontological types scattered across the world, de Castro's approach emphasizes a much more totalizing ontology. He defines it as a full-blown but implicit metaphysics embedded in indigenous practices. Not wanting Amerindian perspectivism to become, quote, just another curio in a vast cabinet of curiosities, uh, de Castro accuses Discola of seeking to build. These are the de Castro's um, critiques of Discola. De Castro approaches perspectivism like a bomb, with, quote, the potential to explode the whole implicit philosophy so dominant in most ethnographers' interpretations of the material, as in Torah states. So this vein of animism elicits a sense of intentionality that facilitates the body as holding the point of view from which the subject emerges. Deleuze takes us further into conceptualizing the subject created by uh, this point of view. And this is what he says. It is not exactly a point, but a place, a position, a site, a linear focus, a line emanating from lines. To the degree it represents variation or inflection, it can be called point of view. Such is the basis of perspectivism which does not mean a dependence in respect to a pre-given or defined subject. To the contrary, a subject will be what comes to the point of view, or rather what remains in the point of view. Insofar as perspectives are embodied in specific uh, dispositions, an apercept of reckoning ensues that calls upon the body as the origin of perspectives. A body with no fixed shape that is a, quote, assemblage of affects or ways of being that constitutes the habitus, as de Castro says. De Castro's theory of uh, offers, on the one hand, a broad essentialized mythic structure applicable across Amerindian societies, while on the other hand, focus in on each type of body as a effective singularity with its own perceptual apparatus. Elaborating on the difference of embodied perspective, De Castro states, rather such difference is located in the bodily difference between species. For the body and its uh, affections, in Spinoza's sense of the body, and the body's capacities to affect and be affected by other bodies, this is the site and the instrument of ontological differentiation and referential disjunction. Right. So this gets us back to VR. And through the experience of VR, a shifting perspective engenders a new experiential compass, unlocking lines of communication in the emergence of unspoken relations. Throughout indigenous cultures of the Americas resides the latent capacity for perspectival shifts engaging in dialogue with spirits and non-human others, changing form in order to see non-humans as they see themselves. In the West, the apprehending human subject detaches and distinguishes herself from that which is inherent in the object, a thing that is known only insofar as it is objectified, inscribed with the projections of the knowing subject. So reference modes of beings enable individuals to cross ontological boundaries, to adopt the perspective of non-human subjectivities and engage in reciprocal exchanges of intentional communication. Here, we might uh, stretch to think of other non-human actors, uh, as, such as the artwork themselves, and perhaps they gain a personhood of sorts, or at least an agency working upon us in the VR. They can come off the wall, they can speak to us, they can tell us stories, not in the same way, of course, but in colorories to the ways in which paintings have never been, uh, been but static images waiting to be apprehended by the people who created them. 
the disembodied or embodied experience of the VR cave challenges the person to consider their body anew, entering a new spatial relation with the artwork in question. And with their imagination in tow, stimulated by sights and sounds of the cave, one might begin to consider their own body as a permeable to the environment present. A certain perspectival shift might occur as they exit their temporality and enter into the androgynous time of the virtual cave, a space of alterarity and of potentiality. For a few brief moments while in the VR space, we have access to an other than human perspective of the virtual. Here one can move through different imaging textures, move through the rock itself, see the curvature while passing through, experiencing space in ways not immediately possible at the physical site itself. The Plato VR gives us pause to think how indigenous ontologies relationships to substance, matter, agency, vitality, and permeability might be invoked by these new environments. One is that reorient subjective and intersubjective gaze, in a sense, bringing space to life in the exchanging and reorienting of perspectives or points of view. So we do not see uh, the VR version of Plato as a reproduction or even straightforward uh, for the representation of the physical site itself. It is something other than that, with its own virtual possibility spaces. Each time it is utilized when the user uh, bodily inhabits its space, it moves from the virtual to the actual and is an entity in its own right. As involved participants of this assemblage making in participation with a wide range of other actions, including uh, the Tohono Indian tribe, it is our hope that this just might have the actualizing power of destabilizing ontologies and democratizing access to such relationships with this magnificent cave. Thank you. Thank you.